Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Welcome to another edition of the Smart City Podcast by ARC Advisory Group. Today, our subject is drones and related technologies, and I'm very happy to be joined by Tim Shea, Senior Analyst at ARC Advisory Group. Uh, welcome aboard today, Tim. Uh, how are you? Uh, very good, Jim. Thanks for having me. Hey, great. Great. Great to talk to you again. Um, Tim, just to get started, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your areas of studies beyond um, and including drones, of course? Sure. Well, I've been doing market intelligence and strategic advisory services for over 25 years now, Jim. Nine of those have been at ARC as a senior analyst, primarily focused on the uh, oil and gas, excuse me, upstream and midstream technology markets, and most recently focusing on the the, uh, the deployment of drones and robotics for use in various process industries uh, such as chemicals, oil and gas, mining, and others. Great. Um, you know, Tim, before we go deep into the uh, drone uh, market, I understand this week you're, you are visiting the, um, the AU VSI conference, I believe, in Orlando with uh, our colleague Dylan Fosa. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, that conference? Yes, uh, very much looking forward to it. They're expecting, uh, you know, they don't know the exact attendance, but they, in the past they've had about 8,000 people. <clears throat> there's, a, there's actually an international contingent expected. And it's going to be comprised of both a series of keynotes on uh, Tuesday, uh, followed by uh, two and a half days of on the show floor. They call it the Expo Hall, where various companies are uh, exhibiting their drone technologies, drone solutions, drone platforms, uh, robotics. Or some of the, I think I've heard rumors that the spot, Boston Dynamic Spot Robotic is going to be there on site with some of its partners like Drone Deploy and companies like that. So I'm looking, very much looking forward to the show. It's a meeting a lot of companies that we've also covered in our various studies that have been either published recently on drones or ongoing. It's soon to be published on drone service providers. So we're looking forward to actually putting some, uh, you know, some uh, some names and faces to websites we've been spending a lot of time visiting over the last several months. So we're really excited about the show. Uh, Dylan will be joining me on Monday, uh, Wednesday. <clears throat> we're going to be, you know, looking to talk to folks and. and just sort of ask them what's going on and what are you seeing in drone technologies, what are some of the challenges and some of the successes that end users ha- are having, and seeing how that that information overlays with what we've been learning as we conduct our re- ongoing research in this exciting uh, marketplace. Wow, Tim, that's that's fascinating. And actually, here on the um, ARC Smart City podcast, we'd love to have you and Dylan back to uh, get your uh, perspectives of this uh, great uh, autonomous and unmanned vehicle uh, show um you know moving on i, I understand you're you're focusing uh, at present on a, on a, a drone uh, market research study um can you tell us a little bit about uh, autonomous operations and the role of drones in that uh, ecosystem Sure. Some of our large uh, oil and gas and chemical clients have, have come to ARC in the recent past and have indicated that they're looking at their uh, autonomous operation roadmaps going forward. Uh, the, obviously, the pandemic has accelerated uh, and, and sort of uh, amplified a lot of these companies' existing plans in, in this area. But the uh, certainly, I guess you'd say, the pandemic sort of uh, you know dumped uh, gasoline on the fire to really accelerate some of these initiatives, and we've been looking at how uh, drones, in this case, uh, autonomous unmanned uh, vehicles, will help play a role in uh, as companies move forward to migrating towards ultimately autonomous operations. We're also obviously going to be looking at uh, uh, robotics in this regards too, as well, from 
companies like uh, quadrupedal companies like any mall uh, uh quadrupedal or boston dynamic spot robots uh, also wheel devices and also those that are sort of run on tracks or or uh, you know like uh, torob or x robotics and companies like that that'll be used to, to get around platforms and, and, uh, and uh, refineries in different locations particularly where there's a lot of hazardous uh you know environments and they need to do conduct things like a uh, methane emissions monitoring leak detection uh you know checking rounds of uh, you know checking the, the gauges of both analog and digital uh, sensor technologies uh you know checking to make sure the valves are closed so just basically doing regular inspection and yeah. maintenance uh type uh, activities yeah, Tim, uh, that that a- actually answers a bit of uh, of my next question, which really was, you know, how how do drones fulfill that promise of of autonomous operations? You, you mentioned a few applications. Um, do any others come to mind? Well, the, the primary drivers for the use of drones and robotics has been and will likely continue to be employee safety. So, uh, for example, if you're thinking about a, a a, a smokestack or a, a flaring stack at a refinery or a chemical plant, maybe you know a couple hundred feet or more tall. Uh, that's a very uh, unsafe, uh, dangerous uh, task for an employee to go up to, to repel these uh, these uh, structures and to conduct inspections. So that the employee safety is critical because the drone can do its fly around, obviously with having the employee on the ground, either on a, on a had right there at the location. They could actually be doing it remotely from some control center if they have the appropriate technology to do so. And so th- th- that's that's the number one driver is employee safety, keeping employees out of harmful uh, locations, keep them from doing dangerous tasks, or in the case of both drones and robotics, also removing the employee from sort of dull, dirty, and repetitive uh, mundane tasks that, 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 that can be done by the robots or the drones what that does, what that does, is free up the employees to do more value-added tasks, where it gives them a chance to actually get additional training, which should help them in their uh, professional, uh, you know, careers in terms of strengthening their skill sets and, and uh, uh, experiences. So the drone is is really is is sort of acting a part and parcel as an employee. The whole idea about autonomous operations is. In many cases, that's usually a, a very a, a remote location. It's one that, you know, getting a, like an offshore platform in the way out in the North Sea, you know, flying in and out employees and supplies on a helicopter is, is expensive. It can have, you can have accidents. Uh, it's very costly. So the idea behind an autonomous operation is that it, it, as, as the great crew change continues to impact these industries where, you know, the gray hairs like, like myself and others, uh, retire. This is a is a challenge to hire the younger generation, who's more likely to say, "Hey, I want to go work for Google or Facebook or AWS or someone like that," as opposed to a dull, dirty job in the oil and gas industry or some chemical plant. So, there's, so the industry is trying to find out how can we face this potential challenge, and they think that autonomous operations can be that future. Now, obviously, with you know technology and 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 just being able to really completely making a plan autonomous is, is, is certainly years away because there's a lot of concerns about liability. You've got you to really make sure that this stuff is, is bulletproof, as they say, in its uh, in capabilities. But drones and robots are certainly a good stepping stone towards that end. And I think that we'll see continued um, increased adoption of those technologies in conjunction with things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, you know, all these different advanced technologies that are going to help play a role as these companies, you know, make their migration to autonomous operations. And within that, you've got the energy transition going on within oil and gas. So there's a lot of dynamics and influx going on in these industries. And we think that drones can certainly play a, a, a pivotal role uh, in that regards because they get the employee out of the dangerous loop. They can do a, a much more of a controlled and consistent data collection. Usually they say that data collection, the data quality is higher because you don't have the human uh, variations between one pilot and another, one inspector and another. So one guy is maybe better at his job than others. So you've got that quality control issue that's always there. You've got the human element, you know, making mistakes and things like that. So that the autonomous technologies that these drones are incorporating with, you know, visual sensors, thermal cameras, you know, acoustic sensors, I mean, you, you name it, there's a number of different payloads they can incorporate on these different drones 
to become a really a mobile data platform or a mobile inspection platform of the future. Tim, let's go a little deeper into the actual sub markets. You know, there are a number of sub markets. Um, one is drone suppliers, there's drone service providers, and then there actually are, you know, aftermarket maintenance and operations services. Can you perhaps um, take each of these individually, starting with perhaps the you know, drone uh, manufacturer supplier market and describe some niche applications that are unique, unique to them and um, the competitive landscape or revolving around suppliers of drones? And then perhaps uh, list some applications that each that um, certain drone suppliers focus upon. Well, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the drone, the applications that drones currently are able to serve are usually fairly sh just straightforward, regardless of which company. Now, certain companies will design a certain type of drone that's better suited for a certain type of application. For example, uh, fixed wing uh, drones as opposed to a rotor drone. Fixed wing drones can typically uh, travel farther, longer distances. And so they're better suited for like uh, inspecting pipelines or power lines, you know, at, at a longer distance because they're, uh, you know, designed to sort of have a, they'll certainly have a rotor perhaps like, like a regular plane might have in the front, but they're more fixed wing and they can, they're designed, many cases they're, they're, they're gasoline, they're gasoline uh, uh, battery hybrids, or they're in some cases they may even be tethered. So that allows them to to operate in the air at a much longer time and distances than a traditional multi-rotor drone. Now, most drones are anywhere from, say, four rotors. You've got hexagon drones that are you know, eight rotors, you know, and, and they and they all carry different size payloads. So you've got smaller drones can carry, say, maybe one camera and perhaps one sensor where they have other bigger drones that, uh, for example, that are rotor based. That can carry multiple cameras or sensors and so and those are the ones that are you know many cases are more specific to a certain type of application so what we found out was that even though you think a drone is a drone the reality is a lot of these drone operations are very siloed in the sense that one drone takes off and does a mission say within mining for example and that drone depending on the application it does, maybe it's doing stockpile measurement or something like that, or it's doing pre and post blast surveying and things like that. That drone may not be able to do uh, another type of application, which perhaps requires a longer distance capability. They're, they're more for, you know, a lot of times these drones are specialized to handle GPS challenge environments. So if you're inside a mine, for example, they can use a solution that Emerson uh, put out that's a slam based LIDAR that not only gives you tremendously high resolution imaging, but it also allows the drones to, using waypoint technologies, to operate where GPS really can operate. So that's something that, that's a specialized type application, for example, that, you know, that a drone might be designed for. Um, other drones, uh, again, depending on the size of the drone and what their, you know, their, their flight capabilities and what's going to, what kind of payload they can handle. Can they handle more than one sensor, one more than one camera? Uh, that's that's those are again designed to handle different applications. So the challenge is much like on the robotic side, there's not a lot of like interruptibility or like you know like a platform that goes across the whole spectrum. So if you look at robots, for example, like Spot may have uh, one version that's through developed through a partner that'll incorporate LIDAR, perhaps it'll incorporate a visual camera, but it is not, it needs to be reconfigured to do other applications. And so the drones have the same type of sort of challenges in terms of not just the battery life technology, which is very much a limiting factor for a lot of these drones, plus or minus, most of them can do, with a normal payload, can do 30 minutes in a flight, plus or minus five or 10 minutes. You know, some of the ones that, like DJI comes out with a new model, they tout it can do 50 minutes, which is like on the high end of performance capabilities with, you know, one or two sensors or one or two cameras. So that's a very much a limiting factor uh, that will, those drones are not as well suited for doing power line inspections or long distance pipeline inspections. That'll be something that's more of a fixed wing, what they call vertical takeoff and landing type device, where it's got a fixed wing, but it's got rotors in the bottom and allows it to take off. 
and then once it gets going, it can go into a fixed wing mode. So it's kind of a sort of a hybrid type device, whereas most of the drones in the market are traditionally just rotor based anywhere from four to six to eight. I suppose there's a couple that have a little bit higher and there's some that are really designed to, you know, handle you know, in the, you know, the over 100 pound capabilities and those are pretty rare. So uh, so that's the, 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 the capabilities, the applications that are served are very much driven a large part by the drone, what sensors are integrated, what cameras can be integrated. What kind of software capability are they are they using imaging, you know, really you know, AI enhanced imaging capabilities for like things like surveying and mapping. There's a lot of companies that come out with software, specific software solutions like Cyberhawk or uh, Drone Deploy. They're, they're software guys. So they have software solutions that are very much designed for, uh, you know, inspections of utilities, for example, or like a company Percepto has its uh, automated inspection monitoring AIM, AIM solution that could be used for, uh, you know, uh, utilities or oil and gas applications, or they even have some of it that can be used. So the drone in the box that they have could be used for surveillance and monitoring of a physical perimeter of, a, of a, or even leak detection of a, you know, of a facility to make sure it's not leaking out gas into the, into the public, you know, sphere, particularly if it's near any kind of like, you know, any kind of housing residential areas. It's, so it's really the, the, the applications. Uh, there's a company called Ericsson, which we all probably are familiar with, which is working on a platform, which is I'm quite fascinating to see how they're doing because they they realize the siloed, the sort of limitations of these siloed things. So you get the battery limitations, you get the, you know, you get all these different factors that could be limitations. So they're trying to develop a platform that can allow these drones to be used across a greater, broader array. Of applications, and I think that, that is also Tim, that, that, that is fascinating. Um, you know, I, as you were speaking about the variety of applications, I had no idea of the breadth of applications there. Oh, what came to mind for me, didn't, didn't even mention. <laughs> but what came to mind for me was that um, I, you know, I come from the transportation domain, and I know that uh, most drones um, cannot. The cameras look downward. And if you're doing bridge inspections, you need a you need a very custom drone to have a camera that actually looks up at the underside of a bridge for corrosion or wear, or you know other other structural um, difficulties. Right. Um, clearly, it's incumbent for the 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 entity, the organization that's considering acquiring drones, to really get down on paper their user needs and 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 create um, you know a structured requirements list. So that they know that um, all their needs will will be satisfied. Um, yeah, well, you had a good point because what we find, particularly in our larger customers, like uh, you know, it's not a secret that Exxon and companies like that are customers of ARC. We find that those large companies will first rely on a, a drone service provider. So that could be a company like, uh, like I, I forgot to mention that the, the big guys and 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 drone manufacturers are obviously DJI is by far the biggest. They're out of China. There's another company called MMC, uh, uh, you know, that, that out of China. There's Parrot, the Sky Do. Uh, there's companies like there's drone in the box specific providers that have really autonomous drones that can take off and land with their own enclosures. So these are sort of weather hardened enclosures that the device can you know, open up the enclosure. The drone can take off, run a fly a pre-programmed uh, mission, or even you know adapt within that mission depending on if something gets in the way if there's something that changes and things like that it can adapt pretty well and return well, to the enclosure and then charge itself up for the next mission those are called drone right. in the well, box and those well, companies well, are like yeah, air robotics yeah. percepto american robotics those are guys that are going to be i think the future of this market once the faa and other regulatory bodies like the faa in different countries get enough comfort with these technologies and to open it up then I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of uh, drone deployments. Obviously, to, to, to allow that to happen, you're going to need a lot of what they call UTM or unmanned traffic management systems that will act like FAA controllers that will keep the drones from crashing into each other. You're going to have drones doing delivery. You'll have drones doing inspections. You're going to have guys doing professional photography of weddings and all kinds of stuff. So you, to try to manage all that is going to be quite an interesting endeavor. Well, Tim, that brings me to, to the second part of, of, of my question. Uh, you, you talked in depth about drone suppliers, but what is a drone service provider versus a supplier itself? Are there third parties that simply have drone management platforms? 
Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, it's a nuance. In, in the, it used to be pretty clear cut. A drone service provider typically would take, in many cases, most of them in the U.S., ironically, would, would, would take a DJI drone, a Matrix or a, 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 an M300 or whatever the drone that was well designed for the certain commercial applications that they were focused on providing a service. They would take that DJI drone incorporate whatever any specific uh, application specific software and they'd have their own pilots uh, typically you know use that drone or drones in this case to fly out and do missions for the for the for the customer they would conduct the inspections they would conduct the say the surveying and mapping or you know change detection or whatever the application may, may have been of interest surveillance and monitoring and then they, they would provide the data in the in the in the form of report, whatever the reporting is. Sometimes it's mandated by certain regulatory bodies. Sometimes it's just for, you know, the, the company wants to show its maintenance. For example, you talked about maintenance and and things like that. That, that. So there's a lot of that activity going on. So drone service providers typically, not always, use a third party drone that's from a parrot or a DJI or some of the SkyDO or something like that, and they'll go off and do the service. That the customer could do. Now we find in many cases the larger customers, once they prove it out, and they're and for, and assuming they're operating in a company, a country, I should say, where they have the capability to get, say, for example, a beyond visual line of sight waiver, which is not easy to get, but a lot of times utilities or BP, for example, in the North Slope in Alaska was able to get one. So there are instances where those companies can go and get the special waiver, and they can do these inspections themselves. We find that the big guys typically prefer to do that but there are certain companies like uh, countries like in the middle east particularly in the uae where a company like falcon eye drones they call them feds which is now owned by aerodyne which is the leader in drone inspection services uh is the only company that you can deal with in the middle pretty much in the middle east if you want to go to uae and do any kind of surveying or mapping or inspections you've got to use this company you can't do it yourself so they've got uh, basically a monopoly in some cases in some of these markets uh, and and they you know provide obviously a good quality service, but you know they're able to they're one of the few companies that can actually make money because there's so much competition in the U.S. because everybody thinks oh I can become a pilot and I'm a big drone service provider, but then you find out there's all kinds of limitations you have to deal with, and then there's all kinds of competition. So a lot of guys were, were, were trying this and, and they weren't too successful, and and so companies like Aerodyne, uh, Terra Drone out of Japan, Cyberhawk out of the U.K., Precision Hawk. These are guys that are kind of sort of the leaders in that space. And in many cases, like Aerodyne has been buying up companies. Like they bought a company, Sensor, in, in Australia that was able to allow them to get a contract for, I think it was a 2 or $3 million telecommunications tower inspection contract by getting this company. So they got their business. So that's how they're growing is they're acquiring other drone service provider companies uh, in different countries and or that have a specialty in an application, which they don't necessarily perhaps have a strength in. Well, so it's let, a fascinating third, let, let, let me jump in with a third part to this to this question. You know, you, you described drone suppliers and drone service providers. Um, do you see third party third parties, um, you know, operating their own ger- drone service provider, um, you know, functions? Uh, I'm thinking about companies that might be, say, uh, digital twin software companies. Uh, do they typically run their own? A uh, drone service provider operation, or do they outsource that to other third parties? Well, I mean, I've seen companies like uh, Bentley Systems, for example, uh, using uh, will typically partner with someone else, but they'll they'll use the drone as a vehicle for their software. So whether it's con- construction or it's uh, you know speed, uh, you know front end engineering design of a of a platform or whatever the case may be, they'll typically work. With a, it, it it could be interesting enough. Like DJI just started to come up with its own drone in the box solution. Uh, but in the past, what someone would do is they probably they'd get a DJI drone. They they put it, you know you can buy these enclosures from a certain company. There's a couple of companies that do that. You'd have to get all the communications. You'd have to get all the the battery charging and all that figured out. And and they integrate this thing as a, sort of like a systems integrator. So there's a lot of companies that I found that were um, uh, doing that because because the drone suppliers didn't want to, they didn't want to bother they just wanted to sell the drone and they that was it and they some of them didn't even do much in terms of hardware they just relied on 
someone else to buy their drone and incorporate the software and all the other stuff. So as far as the digital twin guys, um, we haven't looked at that market in great detail yet. But my suspicion would be that if they're using the drone for, say, you know, or the, the robotics, for example, to create and manage a digital twin, then initially my gut feeling is that software company would just partner with someone else if they get to the point where they're doing enough business you know this drone thing market takes off and i think hopefully in the next two or three years when the faa finally gets this thing called type certification figured out there's some companies like percepto and uh even cisco i think is involved or and these other companies uh, amazon are working on proving to the faa that this autonomous drone technology is very safe that you can fly over people you can fly over you know, at night they're trying to address all these safety concerns that the faa rightly has so once that gets figured out and the faa kind of allows this uh you know greater ease of you know running missions not because i believe lost waiver is one specific mission if that mission's done or you had a problem with that you've got to go back and get another waiver and it's a whole different thing. So it's very onerous, very time consuming. And, and, you know, it's just really has been not, a, it, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a strong uh, fostering uh, mechanism for adoption. So I think once that regulatory issue gets worked out more and more in these different countries, you'll start to see companies that will set perhaps, you know, a Bentley Systems or a Microsoft or whoever that's doing a digital twin that says, hey, I can, you know, I can do a lot of stuff with this drone. Naturally, my inclination to think that they would want to partner with those companies. But if things really get to the point where they get such tremendous volumes, they may want to control that. So they may want to event, they, 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 well, eventually they might do a joint venture or perhaps even an outright acquisition. It's, we're seeing drone companies like AeroVironment bought a, a robotics company, Teleraw, because AeroVironment is primarily focused on the military angle. They have military planes, but they've also got an unmanned division where they have a lot of drones that are, you know, typically designed for military defense applications, but they do have a small commercial uh, aspect to that. So uh, they bought Telerob, but they bought Telerob more because Telerob has these industrial uh, wheeled or track type robots that are, you know, have the aperture and things like that, but they're very ruggedized. They use for military type applications. So I can envision more partnerships like Percepto, is uh, partnering up with Boston Dynamics because Percepto has its autonomous technology, which is a big help to Boston Dynamics. And they don't they don't have the software that for this this aim or autonomous inspection monitoring software. So they're trying to mirror those two together. We're going to see a lot of that type of partnerships of, you know, drone software companies with drone suppliers. You're going to have drone service providers trying to figure out what they're going to do because if they're doing pilot based systems right now. I think that model is going to eventually go away because obviously if 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 the adon- autonomous drones are allowed to uh, to take off and, and flourish, you know you're not going to be able to afford to pay an expensive pilot and an inspector where you can have the drone go off and do that itself and then do that repeatedly after it's charged its battery. And so you've got the repeatability, the consistency, the better data quality, and the and the, obviously the, you know, the better analysis because it's going to be consistent analysis of the same data. So those are all the reasons why I think that in the in the long run. If I was a drone service provider and I was relying on a, a pilot network, a network of pilots, I'd be looking at how can I get into the drone of the box market or whatever, because I think that market is going to eventually, it's just going to go away because it's just the cost uh, just will not make sense to have a piloted, because you're basically paying a pilot in many cases, unless in a rare case you've got a pilot that's also a, a qualified inspector, which I don't know how, I don't think that's a very common experience, but if you have that, you're lucky. Otherwise, you're going to pay a pilot. And these guys are making, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour. And then you got to pay an inspector, and they you know, for the company, they're also making, you know, the same type of money. So it's can be very expensive. And these things could be lasting for, you know, days on end. Whereas a, a drone in the box, autonomous drone, could do that, you know, two or three times a day. Get the consistency, the repeatability, and theoretically the greater accuracy and in, 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 in data collection and, and theoretically data analysis and and uh, action. So Tim, you you introduced the um, you know, some of the obstacles with uh, with you know some commentary about regulatory issues in in the United States and North America. Um, I think op- you know ob- uh, obstacles to the market come in in two flavors. You know, one is regulatory, and then the other is, of course, is the current 
and future technological capabilities in terms of you know battery, you know flight time, flight distance, battery capacity, uh, load carrying capacity. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know how do you view all those obstacles, whatever obstacles there are that might be hindering adoption of drones? Um, first, from you know a regulatory perspective, not only in North America but around the world, and then secondarily from a technology perspective. Well, we kind of talked a little bit about it. Like there's uh, different regulat- regulations within FAA. They, you know, when they created the Part 107, that kind of theoretically opened up the market a little bit, was made a little bit less onerous. A lot of that was all visual line of sight, which means you have to keep constant vigilance of the drone. Now you have instances in this country and others where you may get a beef loss waiver, which again, I think based on the last statistics I saw, it was less than certainly less than five percent of the people that applied for a beef loss waiver were given one. I think it was like less than three percent, but I have to check those numbers and I don't know how data that was. But so it's it's not an easy thing. You go for a beef loss waiver in the United States with the FAA, and it's, you know it's not going to be. You have to be a utility that has to show. You know, this is a you know, for emergency response. You have to show some kind of critical infrastructure type angle to really have a good shot at it. And, and certainly it helps the fact that the area you're doing this in is a remote or rural area. American Robotics was approved for a, a non-piloted autonomous operations by the FAA, but it had to be it was very rural areas. It was, you know, can fly over 400 feet. In some cases, in that case, they didn't even need a visual observer either by person or by car. So many of these BVLOS waivers to add additional safety, the FAA would mandate that you've got to have one or more observers that are say a mile or two down away from the pilot that can keep the drone in their sight. So there's a continuous uh, connection of visual observation. So that 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 challenge uh, exists. I think the FAA right now is, is, factored, is really just a, recently announced a 400 page report, which had some interesting Findings. It looks like that they're starting to really, you know, get a, get, you know, understand the challenges that the industry has, and so they're trying to get away from a very rigid approach to more of a more of a case by case situation. And what they're trying to focus on is this thing called type certification, whereas a B loss waiver was for a very specific mission. You're going to fly this area for this amount of time to do this, but the type certification is more looking at it by model. So if DGI has, a, say, a, a Matrix 600 or whatever, the the, the, the uh, pe- uh, Parrot and Nafi.ai uh, drone model, which they're working with uh, uh, Skyward, which is part of Horizon, which is doing a lot of exciting things because they've got the communications angle for 4G and 5G, which is obviously going to play a huge role uh, as this market un- un- unfolds. But in that instance, um, there the type certification would say you can fly these missions as long as that drone model has been approved as airworthy and safe by the FAA. But if you make any material changes to that with new new, new iterations, then you'd probably have to go back and get recertified. But it really should make it a lot but less onerous, should really help to open up the market. And it's going to really what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to sort of uh, incent, uh, provide a, uh, a merit badge for those companies that have really proven that their technology is really good because they have to prove this to the FAA that their autonomous operations can, you know, t- detect and avoid. They can, you know, and they can, you know, they they'll have a parachute, for example, for you know, for additional safety. Maybe they perhaps they'll have to start, you know, enclosing in, in their their rotors with some kind of round piece around them to keep the rotor from. If it did crash, they don't want it to obviously, you know, cut people's uh, in, injure people, things things like that. So that FAA. Um, those the red the remote ID was a was a was a step in the right direction. Being able to allow certain companies to operate at night based on certain conditions, they have to have certain lights that you know obviously strong LED lighting and things like that. So those those things that are helping to move the industry along. But obviously the technology is advancing far faster than the FAA is is in responding. So that's going to continue to be the lagging factor. And that's true. That's, um, that's, see- that's true for a lot of countries as well. Uh, Mexico yeah, may be much easier that, to do drones. Uh, U, UAE is you can only have one company that does it basically, and there's uh, you know so there's companies like Canada that are pretty tough, Israel that are pretty tough. So different companies are kind of most tend to be on the more stringent side. That's the real regulatory issue right there, as far as I can see. And there's different ways they're trying to address that now, which is great. The technological issue is going to be always batteries have been a problem for a long time. 
you look at, uh, look at electric vehicles, you look at smartphones, you look at computing, battery technology continues to be one of the gating items in terms of greater adoption in terms of the drone uh, markets. Because if you're going to be running a piloted drone and you, you got a guy out there and you're paying him, you know, $100, $200 an hour and he's flying, you know, missions at 20 minutes and then he's got to come back down and then see, you know, he's out there eight hours and you're not getting, you know, you're not getting enough missions to really, to make the, the numbers, to, to make it work in many cases. So I think the battery technology in terms of just length of time, that's a problem. They have, they're trying to address it. There are even people talking about using hydrogen for drones. I think that's going to be pretty far up, and we'll see how they do. Uh, some people try to address the problem using tethers, because then the drone can be up there for quite, quite a because it's getting power and things like that through the, through the tethered device, so it can operate at much longer times and distances. Um, so it's that's the biggest factor is batteries. I think the, the there's not really a limiting factor per se, but if you look at AI and advanced machine vision and, uh, you know, just uh, autonomous uh, artificial intelligence and sensing, being able to use cameras and sensors to, you know, to microsecond, you know, 300 iterations per second to ch- check the drone's location. What's, you know, is there anything, is there any kind of obstacle in front of it? So that type of technology, I think is really, I don't see that as being a limiting factor. Uh, on that side, I think it's more the it's really the battery technology, so in my opinion, that's the, the biggest factor. That because I think artificial intelligence and machine learning is making tremendous strides, and it's really just trying to get the people, the culture, the people that, that you could be using these things to even some of the drone service providers, the pilots are you know have to learn some of this new technology and get you know get acquainted to it because that's still going to be needed for the foreseeable future until the FAA really starts to open up. This autonomous operation for drones, and that I think will slowly, you know, could, you know, within a year or two, wipe out a lot of these pilot based uh, drone service providers. Well, Tim, thanks. Um, you, you've touched on, you know, many, many uh, aspects of how the drone market and the uh, autonomous robot market will, will develop in the future. Um, is there anything that you've left out today that you'd like to mention? If I, if I listen to this in a, in a, in a day or so, they're probably. Sure, there'll be, there'll be things, but I think just to, to reiterate the landscape, the big players that we encountered were companies like, uh, in fact, I should open up the spreadsheet so I can actually talk to the, you know, but the, the people like DGI, MMC, there's a couple of other companies in, in China that escaped my, my brain at the moment, but uh, uh, Parrot, you know, SkyDO, uh, this, I, I want to make, they're not necessarily the biggest players, but I think the drone service, the drone in the box providers like Percepto, like Air Robotics, like American Robotics, Azure. Those are guys that I think, again, as the FAA opens up its, you know, its, its regulations, I think we're going to see those type of companies and others. I think what's going to happen is you'll have, you know, I mean, Intel, for example, was involved in drones earlier in the, in the past. And, and Amazon is working uh, uh, with, you know, Walmart, people like that for delivery. Those are markets that we haven't necessarily covered. We have a supply chain group that might look at that. But those are it's a, potentially another big market is the delivery market, you know, for medicine. And, and uh, you know, but, but the problem with that is in most cases, that payload is going to, you know, most of these rotors, of rotor-based drones are not going to be able to handle heavier packages. So you're going to be limited to what you can ship. I think medical, you know, pharmaceuticals could be a really good application because those are, Potentially not only life saving, but they're, they're certainly higher dollar value uh, delivery loads, but they're not necessarily that heavy. So it's 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 a it's a it's a it's, a, it's the, the numbers make more sense. Whereas if you're trying to have a drone go out and deliver a bunch of uh, you know uh, lip uh, not lipstick but uh, you know lip balm or something like that, I mean that it's you know you, are you gonna you're gonna send you're gonna pay for a drone to deliver something that the total value is you know. Twenty-five dollars. It just some of this stuff is just economically not going to make sense when you step back and look at it that way. But I think if you look at it from the standpoint of, of you know pharmaceuticals, drug, drug delivery, uh, certainly that can play a role. I think um, in that regards. But so, anyways, to go back to the, the the leading guys, DGI was by far the leading player based on our research. Parrot, which is at the time was owned by SenseFly, but SenseFly has since been uh, sold off to Ag Eagle, which is a company that's been doing a lot of activity as well. They're focused more on the hemp market and agriculture, but they are incorporating SenseFly. They've, you know, some other companies they've uh, picked up. MMC 
UAV out of China, Flyability, which is, has a unique a drone solution that has its own. It flies around in this like little uh, little cage, so that it can fly around in this drone. And so its way of handling, you know, going into storage tanks and things that that's where their specialty is is in these GPS challenged environments where confined spaces and things like that. This thing can bounce off the walls because it's got this protective sort of this caging uh, situation. Uh, Chengdu, J-O-U-A, Joav out of China, Ewat, Del Air is a, is a fixed wing. You know, Ewat is a, has a combination of fixed wing and rotor-based. Del Air is a fixed wing provider. Aerobotics is one of those companies I mentioned. It's a, a um, you know, it's a drone of the box supplier. Micro Drones has got a partnership with GE Industrial Drones, and they do a lot of work in surveying and mapping. That's a big, big specialty of theirs. Azure, Azure Drones, without the E on the end of it, is, uh, is a Drone of the box supplier in situ is a company that's owned part of Raytheon that does uh, some specialty pipeline inspections. Drone Vault Aerial Tronics is, is, a, is a kind of a combination of companies. Skyfish, Perceptor, as I mentioned before. Then there's other companies that do uh, various types of uh, fixed wing or uh, vertical takeoff and landing fixed wing. Or they do rotor base. Some have both. So there's a lot of interesting companies that. Uh, so that's the, the drones manufacturers market. The drone service providers. The leaders are, again, companies like Aerodyne, uh, Terradrone, Cyberhawk is a company out of the UK that does a lot of work. Precision Hawk is noteworthy because they signed a global deal with a shell, not just for drones, but they use they have this unique software, sort of asset management software package that, that Shell is going to roll out for a lot of its global asset management uh, projects across the globe. So that was a big, big win for those guys. Uh, there's uh, you know, companies like that. There's, there's other companies. Then you get a whole bunch of smaller drone service guys that are just you know handling a certain location and or a certain uh, they specialize in a certain application so that's it's a very fascinating market but it's uh, it's certainly growing for example if you look at american robotics they were bought by ondas in the, uh, the early part of 2021 their q1 results according to ondas uh, financials was uh, fifty thousand dollars for the whole quarter and quarter q1 which is they, that company was bought for seventy-four and a half million dollars, so the multiples were almost infinitesimal. But they uh, most recently, their most recent ten uh, K, uh, ten Q, I think it was, had shown that their quarterly results was above twenty million. So talk about a tremendous growth that they've seen in getting major oil and gas companies and chemical companies to uh, to to incorporate and adopt their solutions. So there's tremendous growth opportunity as this company and, and Feds I talked to in the Middle East. The guy told me that if when I talked to him earlier this year, he said, if call me back in six months, we'll be three you know, five times the growth that we you know we talked about earlier. So there's a lot of tremendous amount of growth. And a lot of that is just because the pandemic, I think increasingly more and more companies are coming out with, uh, you know, uh, uh, more, more, uh, more, I shouldn't say more sane, but more, uh, or company more accommodating uh, regulations that's a, a long greater adoption there is one company i forgot to mention out of uh, at a hamburg germany hhla sky there they were uh, basically a couple of guys ex siemens guys that uh, basically had a parent company that does a lot of ports and containers so that's their that's their business is in you know, port of hamburg and other places like that and so they designed their own uh, drone solution for their own purposes and then it, it turned out to be one of the most impressive end-to-end -end drone solutions I've I've seen. And they claim, and I probably believe them, that they can, you know, operate remotely from a control center, you know, over 100 drones at one time. And they've been deemed critical infrastructure because they you know, do a lot of the ports in Germany by the German government. So they can obviously do beef loss flights and things like that. So they've, they're they coming out with a solution that I think is going to really have a, a strong impact, not just in that market, but potentially in others like in oil and gas, you know, doing wind turbine inspections and, and things like that. That I think that uh, um, there's you know tremendous a tremendous need because companies need to find ways to address the great crew change so they can't get enough people, and they either lay them off because the, the oil prices went down, or oil went, even when the oil prices go back up, they're having a hard time hiring people. So they need to find technology, including drones or robotics, to help fill that gap. And they're also using, as we know, digital technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning things of that nature to help fill that gap and sort of the technology becomes the advisor of the younger generation, tells them not necessarily a truly closed loop operation, although the technology is getting that capability, but it's, it's sort of acting as an advisor in the interim until we get to that point where greater autonomous operations is, is becoming the norm. That's, in my opinion, that's going to be 
probably 10, 20 years minimum before we get to that point, but we'll see. Well, Tim, thank you very much. We're we're nearing the end of our of our podcast today. Um, earlier, you stated that uh, yourself and Dylan Fosa will be visiting the AU VSI Exponential event in Orlando this week. Yeah. Um, if anyone would like to meet you um, down there in Orlando um, or reach out to you if they're not in Orlando this week, uh, in future weeks, um, how do they contact you? Well, they can reach me at my email at tshea at arcweb.com, or they can find me on Twitter at uh, uh, tshea at arc. That's my Twitter handle. And then they can also find me on LinkedIn. And sure. And that's, so I'm, I'm pretty active in both. Right. And welcome well, any the chance to discuss questions, suggestions, anything. Always great to talk and learn new things. Tim, this has been very enlightening for me, and I'm sure I'm sure it will be for for our listeners. Thank you very much for being a guest today on the Smart City Podcast, and I look forward to talking to you again after the AUVSI Exponential Event for your perspectives um, on your week there this week, and uh, of course on future Smart City Podcasts on um, additional subjects that you study. So oh, thank I you very much. Forget, Tim. I forgot. I forgot one thing. I did. Shame on me for forgetting it. We have our annual 26th annual ARC industry forum going on in Orlando, June uh, 6th through the 9th. And I have a, a drone session on Thursday morning at 1030 on June 9th that we're going to have uh, different speakers and panelists talking about exactly this, talking about how they've been, you know, what the challenges they had previously, how they incorporated drones, what kind of challenges, if any, they had in, in deploying those drones, and more importantly, what kind of successes they've had and what kind of lessons learned or what kind of new applications that they encountered that that you know maybe perhaps someone didn't think of until they actually started using in their operations and said aha perhaps they can do it be used here or be used there so we're very excited for that opportunity and um, we welcome the uh, chance to join we have a slot for one other speaker left uh, we have forward power and light and, and another company uh, that's going to be speaking so we're hoping to get a third one and uh, we hope to see you in Orlando. Yeah, and Tim, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind our audience that um, end users do qualify for a complimentary ticket Great point. to the ARC form in Orlando, again, June 6th to, to, to the 9th. Um, there are four technology tracks over two and a half days with a number of workshops um, in the uh, day before. So it's a it's a great opportunity to learn um, an awful lot, not only about drones, but about digital transformation sure. and smart cities uh, and the energy, energy transition, energy transition absolutely. sustainability, sustainability. So we welcome anyone who's um, would like to come to Orlando um, to join us at the ARC 26th annual forum. One, one um, shameless last plug. Uh, one shameless last plug is I just read an article in the plane ride down to Orlando this early this morning was about how uh, particularly drones are being uh, are used as a way of helping companies to lower their carbon footprint. Because instead of taking a, a very expensive and gas guzzling or jet fuel guzzling helicopter or perhaps jet, they fly a drone, which is typically battery operated. So there's no carbon emitted. And so I think there's a, you know, it's a small role, but I think that uh, even robots, I think will be playing a role in helping in that regard. So it's interesting how companies are seeing how that they can not only help with, you know, basically keeping employees safe and mitigating things like that, but also you get the benefit of, uh, you know, lower cost inspections, better quality inspections, more consistent data. And then on top of that, hey, you can help save the environment a little bit. So it's just an added bonus. Tim, thank you again very much for being a guest. This has just been an insightful hour. And we'll have you back again soon. And thank you, everyone, for listening in and subscribing to the Smart City Podcast. Thanks, Trip. Take care, Tim. Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities Podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at 
Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities.